You're listening to the Diplomats podcast on Asian geopolitics. As always, I'm your host, Ankit Panda from New York City. And this is Prashant Parmaswaran from Washington, D.C. How's it going, Prashant? Good. How are you doing? Good. I uh, hope you had a good flight back from Asia, because I certainly did. Yeah, it was great. Um, so to our listeners, um, our podcast was on hiatus for a uh, brief week because Prashant and I were traveling. We both had the good fortune last week of being at the Shangri-La Dialogue in uh, Singapore, where we both also were in 2017. And um, for those of you who might not know, the Shangri-La Dialogue is Asia's um, premier security forum, brings together um, defense officials from a variety of countries, both in the region and outside the region. There are actually several defense ministers this year from countries outside of the region, which was an interesting um, sight to see. Um, but it's also a uh, daily, st um, an annual stop on the U.S. Secretary of Defense's calendar. The U.S. usually rolls out a variety of important security um, initiatives related to Asia, um, and certainly U.S. legislators also use the dialogue as an opportunity to do the same. We saw a few senators this year use the opportunity to um, make the U.S. commitment to Asia well known. Um, and in recent years, the Shangri-La Dialogue um, has um, seen itself turn into something of a... Um, a forum for the United States and China to uh, air some of their hesitations about one another uh, in public. Um, and what's been a bit of a shame is that the Chinese uh, People's Liberation Army has actually been uh, sending a lower level representation than many of these other countries, um, certainly below the level of defense minister or a member of the Central Military Commission. Um, they were supposed to upgrade their presence this year, but that unfortunately didn't happen, even though last year they had told the hosts, uh, the International Institute for Strategic Studies, that the then oncoming 19th Party Congress was part of the result, um, part of the reason for China having to downgrade its presence. Um, but Prashant, um, we, you know, I think uh, you and I both uh, walked away from the dialogue with fairly similar impressions. Um, and if I had to kind of pick one big theme for us to start this podcast off with. Um, I think we both know what's the obvious go-to here, which is the Indo-Pacific, mm -hmm. um, which I think, you know, many people had seen coming. Um, the United States uh, had been talking about the Indo-Pacific concept for a while, at least since um, a major policy address by former Secretary of State Rex Tillerson in October about India when the U.S. really started incorporating the Indo-Pacific language into its uh, everyday strategic rhetoric. Um, and then we saw the phrase reoccur in the national security strategy, the national defense strategy. Um, but obviously, we also had Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi keynoting the entire uh, event. Um, and he also had a, a fairly interesting address uh, that was a little bit all over the place when it came to themes. But I want to ask you, so, you know, now that you're back from the Shangri-La dialogue, do you have a better sense of what the Indo-Pacific is? Is it a strategy? Is it a geographic area? What is the Indo-Pacific? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's the sort of big question for, for observers. And it, it came through um, in conversations that were, you know, at the dialogue, both both actually in the official sessions, as well as in, in, in sort of the corridors among delegates. Um, it, it's it's one which I think the, the administration has been smart to roll out early. I think there was a lot of demand coming uh, early on in the Trump administration for some kind of approach to Asia. So I think it's encouraging that they've rolled it out. But since they've rolled it out, um, I think there there have been a lot of mischaracterizations of the strategy and also um, really not as much sort of details that have been rolled out about specifically what it means. So as of now, and I think this is what uh, Sec Secretary Mattis mentioned in his address, it, it seems like it's a it's a sort of uh, defense of certain principles that the United States uh, and its allies and partners want to defend as part of the so-called rules-based international order, right? So whether it's, um, you know, freedom from coercion, the openness of um, the, the sea uh, and air domains, cyber domains, um, openness in terms of infrastructure, and those are things which I think in general, um, you know, enough countries can get around. Uh, I think the, the, the key questions are really the extent to which those principles are actually being defended uh, by this allied and partner network and, and including by the United States. I think there's a lot of questions about, particularly on trade and the economic side, um, what the United States is doing. There's a lot of uncertainty about the extent to which you know this is actually implementable and it will be actually resourced. 
Um, and then the the third and final question is, you know, what what is the role of various actors in this sort of Indo-Pacific strategy, particularly ASEAN and Southeast Asia? Mm -hmm. And I think those questions were not really significantly addressed um, in in the sort of you know whether it's Mattis's articulation of the Indo-Pacific strategy or what you've heard from other U.S. officials. And I think that's really at the heart of the question. You hinted at this too. You know, Modi gave an address um, and sort of, you know, I think there were some people who were expecting him to put sort of the Indo in the Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, but his address was very much, I mean, not very surprising from an Indian foreign policy perspective in terms of being, you know, hitting all the right notes in terms of allies and partners. But you could see if you contrasted that with Mattis's speech, you know, how the Indians view their approach to the so-called Indo-Pacific and how the United States views it. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think there's a lot to uh, break down in what you just said. Um, you know, something that I do want to come back to, I'm not going to get into it right now, but um, is the uh, interesting emphasis on ASEAN centrality from both Modi and Mattis. You know, mm -hmm. I thought that was an interesting move for both of them to do that in uh, in Shangri-La, especially after the Singaporeans had publicly, you know, expressed a little bit of skepticism about this whole Indo-Pacific business. So we can come back to that. Mm -hmm. Um but to talk about Modi's speech, uh, yeah, so you're absolutely right that the Indians and the Americans have a slightly different way of thinking about the Indo-Pacific. I mean, first of all, there's the geographic um, aspect to it. So just days before the Shangri-La dialogue, um, Mattis oversaw the um, relieving of uh, Admiral Harry Harris from the command of Pacific Command. We now have Philip Davidson, who's um, leading that command. And, now, and more importantly, uh, Pacific Command is now known as Indo-Pacific Command or Indo-PACOM. And the area of responsibility remains the same. So you have that line in the middle of the Indian Ocean that delineates PACOM's AOR, Indo-PACOM's AOR from CENCOM and AFRICOM's AOR in the Indian Ocean. And that's roughly, that roughly begins at the corner of where um, Indian Gujarat meets Pakistani Sindh. And you draw a line straight down the Indian Ocean. But for the Indians, and Modi said this in his speech, the Indian Ocean, um, as it is in reality, extends from the eastern coast of Africa all the way to um, Sumatra and uh, the western coast of Australia. Um, it's, a, it's a much broader region in the Indian context. And I think Modi's broad uh, message, um, and certainly I think this was maybe a first for the Shangri-La Dialogue to have a keynote speaker bring this much of an Indian Ocean emphasis uh, to the event, which has you know, traditionally been most of a mostly a Southeast Asian and East Asian security forum. Um, but Modi emphasized why India was indispensable to this region. Um, and he made a uh, strong claim that the Asia Pacific today is multipolar, that there's no one country that can dominate the region, uh, which was something that um, obviously Mattis did not necessarily um, share in, a, in his address. Um, but w what I thought was most interesting about Modi's speech, uh, in, a, in addition to the uh, thematic diversity, you might say, was how it effectively served as a bit of a Rorschach test. And I think that's maybe a, a sign of a good keynote speech was that, um, you know, depending on who you talk to at the dialogue and depending on what they felt about India's relationship with China or what India should be doing about China, they either saw a speech that was actually quite explicitly um, strong on sort of asserting where India's red lines were for China and what, uh, you know, India's support for the rules-based order. But a few other observers I talked to really saw Modi kind of sustaining that goodwill that came out of the Wuhan meeting with Xi Jinping in, in late April. Um, so that was an interesting balance. I mean, for me personally, I thought the speech was predictably uh, in line with um, Indian foreign policy um, on these issues for the past few years, that there were no major surprises. Delhi's been regularly voicing its support for things like freedom of navigation and stuff now with the United States. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, on infrastructure, we heard the language about connectivity and inclusiveness. Um, that was, uh, again, again, quite interesting to see. Um, but you know, uh, do you want to talk briefly about the, uh, the ASEAN centrality business on the Indo-Pacific? I'm really curious for your thoughts on that. No, absolutely. I, I think that's that's kind of the the other big piece of this, right? Because um, in this year in particular, the Singaporeans that host the Shangri-La Dialogue annually are also the the chair of ASEAN this year, and so it, it was even more important, I think, for key countries to acknowledge that point. But I think the interesting uh, point that I think some observers noticed was. Um, while you did have Mattis and Modi and a number of other countries, you know, mention ASEAN centrality and kind of highlight that because there is some uncertainty, I think, in, in Southeast Asia and really some still some misunderstanding about what exactly the Indo-Pacific is and what ASEAN's role in it is. 
Um, there's also confusion about whether this is sort of the quadrilateral um, and really the major powers getting together and not much of a role for Southeast Asia. So there, there is that reassurance piece. Um, but I also think um, more broadly with respect to the Indo-Pacific, it isn't really clear yet where the United States um, and these other countries see Southeast Asia more specifically, but it's also not clear that these sort of um, rhetorical proclamations about ASEAN centrality were actually shared by the Southeast Asian speakers and delegates <laughs> present at the Shangri-La Dialogue. I think, you know, among the speeches, including from the Vietnamese defense minister, um, from the Indonesian defense minister, the tone was strikingly sort of, you know, ASEAN is facing significant challenges. And while we do acknowledge, you know, ASEAN's importance, we also can't ignore these sub-regional initiatives, and we also need to reinforce our relationships with major powers. So it was a, it was kind of an interesting dynamic where you did see external countries emphasize ASEAN centrality, at least rhetorically, more so than some of the Southeast Asian delegates, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, to, to kind of broaden the conversation a bit outside of the uh, Indo-Pacific business, which I think, you know, all of us are still figuring out. And obviously, I think the administration in the U.S. has to show where the rubber will really hit the road on the free and open Indo-Pacific. Um, but, you know, Shangri-La, as it is every year, is a um, is not organized around one single theme, be it the Indo-Pacific or be it the pivot or the principal security network or whatever. Those are themes often brought by U.S. defense ministers that end up um, absorbing a lot of the oxygen in the discourse around the dialogue. But Shangri-La is, is a diverse forum. And this year we had um, any range of topics um, come up. Uh, for instance, I mean, uh, this year's dialogue took place uh, almost exactly a year after the uh, Amaute group's um, siege of Marawi City began, which actually I think had just kicked off last year when you and I uh, had just arrived at the dialogue. And I believe the Philippines defense minister had to pull out at the last minute to uh, deal with mm -hmm. that. So we saw some reflection on what the Philippines had taken away from its uh, its counterterrorism um, preparedness out of the Marawi episode. Uh, we saw more a discussion of um, piracy in the region, um, a, a whole session on the sidelines on Arakhine State featuring Myanmar's national security advisor, uh, which was quite interesting, uh, engaging uh, to see him engage with um, representatives from civil society society organizations uh, discussing the uh, appalling uh, state of affairs in, in that part of Myanmar. Um, but also the Korean Peninsula, we had a whole uh, plenary session devoted to that issue. And I was actually pleasantly surprised at how little the uh, Trump-Kim summit, which is now six days away, uh, seemed to actually dominate the uh, the dialogue. I think um, many people were happy to let the uncertainty remain um, about that summit. And mm -hmm. while I think we saw some discussion of, of um, denuclearization and the way to move past CVID, the complete, verifiable, and irreversible denuclearization of North Korea, we didn't really get a satisfactory answer. Um, so, you know, I wanted to ask you, uh, so, you know, thinking a bit on, the, you know, what we heard about Southeast Asian efforts uh, on counterterrorism after Marawi and uh, anxiety about um, returning foreign fighters and the Indonesian defense minister speech, which uh, unfortunately was coming uh, not long after the horrifying uh, triple suicide bomb attacks in uh, in Surabaya. There was obviously a major focus on, on terrorism, which I think often gets lost in, in discussions about, you know, grand strategic initiatives like the free and open Indo-Pacific. Um, but what were your impressions about um, about the uh, the terrorism components of this year's dialogue. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that was uh, definitely another key consideration that came through. Again, it, it was uh, last year as well, and I think this year it continued to be the case. The, the first point about that is, I think, to reinforce what you just said, which is really important, which is um, you do see at the Shangri-La Dialogue, we, we have had this dynamic in the past, and we had it this year as well, where you have these sort of grand strategic concerns like you know, U.S.-China competition, uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, South China Sea, and and um, those issues. But you also have, particularly from the Southeast Asian representatives that attend the dialogue, you know, a real sense that um, while those grand strategic concerns are, are really important, the day-to-day -day affairs are, are more sort of, you know, around terrorism, transnational crimes, and the like. And that dynamic, I think, still played out this year as well. So that's the general point. I think on, on terrorism in particular this year, you, you did see, particularly from the Indonesians and the Filipinos, a real sense that uh, 
hey, um, you know, the, the Marawi siege is, is over, um, but we really need to think about sort of the next phase of terrorism here and the broader issues at play. And there's various components to that. One is making sure that Southeast Asian states are prepared for urban warfare that's waged by terrorist groups. And, and, and the Philippine defense minister um, rightly sort of pointed to that. But then it's also um, making sure that counterterrorism efforts are addressed in a more sort of comprehensive fashion. I think there's a real concern um, among countries that this is being seen as more of sort of a, a police, security, military initiative rather than something that needs to be broad based and, you know, include things like education reform, um, you know, socioeconomic development and the like. And you did see encouragingly that several countries made the case that this is something that is a whole of government approach and it's something that needs to be comprehensive. And yes, ASEAN is an important role to play, but we also need this sort of sub-regional initiatives, right? So things we've talked about before, like trilateral cooperation in the Sulu Sulu SECs, um, those were definitely um, you know discussed as well in addition to um, the Australians kind of mentioning their role, right, um, in terms of counterterrorism to make sure that uh, that's acknowledged as well. So I think that that's kind of where the terrorism discussion is. Um, and the the other big one, as you correctly mentioned this year, was was North Korea. And I, I think you're right to kind of say that um, it it didn't sort of overshadow the the broader discussions. Um, but definitely, I mean, the fact that we had a whole plenary session devoted to it, um, and there really was a sense that, hey, you know, we, we really do want to talk about, you know, in the hallways, um, you know, what is this Trump-Kim summit about? How will this sort of North Korea conversation evolve? Um, that was definitely interesting to see. And, and I'd be curious to, to see what your impressions were um, in terms of the conversations that you had on North Korea. Sure. I mean, I think I mean, so first of all, yeah, there were definitely a lot of conversations on the sidelines. And I, you know, I did a bunch of um, press interviews on the sidelines about this summit, basically saying mm -hmm. the same thing over and over that there's, you know, a lot of uncertainty and Trump is Trump and anything could really happen at this meeting, um, even though we sort of are getting now the contours of what the administration is going in looking for. Uh, that plenary session with the um, Japanese and uh, South Korean defense ministers uh, on the same panel, I thought was quite interesting. Uh, you had sort of a good cop, bad cop routine, um, sort of almost a caricature of what we've seen out of Japan and South Korea through the diplomatic process that began in early 2018, right? We've known that the Abe administration is not the most enthusiastic about the diplomatic engagement with not, with North Korea, um, not least because uh, Japan certainly feels that the Trump administration is far from interested in what Tokyo considers to be its core priorities with regard to North Korea. Um, and on the other hand, you had um, Minister Song Young moo uh, the South Korean defense minister, giving an unusually optimistic appraisal mm -hmm of the state of diplomacy. I mean, it really raised eyebrows on the, around the room, you know, when he was answering a few questions and he implied that uh, North Korea's short range missiles would um, go away by themselves because Pyongyang would decide that after peace came to the peninsula, that the costs of maintaining these missiles would be too high and it would, you know, see it fit to divert resources towards its economy. Um, it was, it, it was really, you know, unlike the kind of, um, a discourse I'd expect to see uh, at, at a Shangri-La dialogue. And, you know, a lot of us grilled him. A lot of uh, Korea analysts, you know, Mark Fitzpatrick, Robert Kelly and I basically asked him the same question at that plenary about about CVID and what else from CVID can be given to the North Koreans because the North Koreans will simply not accept CVID. But we're still in that place in North Korea discourse where it's very difficult for officials from any country to... Uh, to fully uh, abandon that. Um, it was interesting also that, you know, the minister was using the Panmunjom Declaration language of, uh, quote unquote, complete denuclearization. And he never really clarified exactly what that meant to South Korea. Um, I did kind of hold him over the coals and, you know, explicitly address the issue of what would happen to U.S. troops after a peace treaty mm -hmm. and uh, address the comments made recently by um Chungin Moon, um, Moon Jae-in's um, advisor on national security affairs, um, who, who implied in a foreign affairs article that uh, it would be difficult to justify the presence of U.S. troops in the country after a peace treaty, which is a, a conventional view, but I wanted to hear the government's take on it. And he uh, sort of said explicitly that that was not the Moon government's um, thinking about that issue, which was which was good to hear um, on, on that level, especially 
uh, you know, just um, 10 or so days before the summit meeting. Um, but yeah, overall, yeah. I think, um, you know, the, it was a, it was good to see that North Korea didn't kind of absorb all the oxygen in the Shangri-La Hotel, um, because it certainly has for a year and a half now when it comes to the Trump administration's Asia policy, um, more or less. Um, so yeah. I think now with this summit around the corner, we're all, um, we're all, you know, holding our breath and waiting to see what comes out of it. Yeah, and I, I think the other striking difference that I saw um, in the South Korea and, J and Japan speeches was, um, I think for the Japanese, there was a, in, in the address, there was a conscious effort to make sure that even though the plenary session topic was North Korea, they did address the you know Japan's broader strategic interests in the Indo-Pacific region, and there was an attempt to reference that. I didn't see that so much in um, Defense Minister Song's speech. Um, it was mostly, almost entirely, actually, on, on North Korea. And so um, I do think that sort of plays into the fact that the, you know, the South Koreans do have this um, sort of new Southern strategy and approach to Southeast Asia. And it, it is something that's still there, and they, they are working on it. Um, but compared to his address at the Fullerton Forum uh, earlier this year, I did note that this was almost entirely focused on, on, on North Korea. So I think that there's always this sort of uh, striking suspicion whenever the South Koreans are involved so much in North Korea that that might distract them from their broader role um, in the region, even though, I mean, the, the focus on North Korea obviously is understandable. Um, so that's another thing that I thought was really interesting that came through. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you, Prashant, um, what did you, you know, we we both uh, went to this dialogue, you know, two years in a row, and I thought it was interesting because last year was a particularly interesting year to go with all the anxieties about the Trump administration and how it would operationalize it's Asia policy. Um, and, you know, we got to see Jim Mattis twice before the Shangri-La audience. And this year, at least to my eye, he seemed to be a lot more comfortable and ready. You know, last year he had his famous moment when he told Michael Fully Love in answer to his question that U.S. allies and partners will have to, quote unquote, bear with us as the Trump administration, um, I guess, figures out its Asia policy. And uh, this year, you know, he seemed to have a better idea. He was better briefed, um, better prepared. He did get a curveball of a question on the issue of the U.S.-Philippines Mutual Defense Treaty and Second Thomas Shoal, uh, which he, I think, gave an answer that wasn't necessarily satisfying to a lot of um, Philippine observers. Um, but, you know, what were, uh, if you had to kind of compare the mood pretty broadly between the two years, um, what what was your big takeaway? Um, I I think the, you're, you're right. I mean, I think um, Mattis, uh, in, I think in his speech um, said, uh, explicitly that last year he was sort of more in a settling mood, um, sort of more in, in terms of listening. And then this year he wanted to sort of lay out uh, the U.S. vision. Um, I, I think the mood, though, I, I sensed was kind of similar, right? Like last year, the focus was on the so-called rules-based international order. And I think there was a lot of skepticism by delegates there about, you know, we do accept this idea that this order exists, but how exactly will the United States defend it? You know, which partners is it talking about that's actually going to defend it? And to what extent are the Trump administration's actions actually undermining this this so-called rules-based international order? Um, and I think this year the, the concerns are similar, even though the Trump administration's approach um, and the so-called so Indo-Pacific strategy is actually uh, more clearly articulated. Uh, I sense that, you know, one particular case that I can see a lot of similarity is on the South China Sea. There's almost been this sort of steady um, desensitization in the region in terms of um, the U.S. approach and the responses by regional states. Um, and I think this year you saw a similar pattern where, um, you know, Mattis spoke very strongly on the South China Sea. And I think people appreciated how uh, how much he did in terms of the rhetoric. But I think, you know, the, the realization in, uh, is that the Chinese militarization of the South China Sea is is a reality that all countries have to deal with. And I think you had a question, in fact, at the, the plenary session where um, one person uh, just explicitly said, you know, has the ship actually sailed on the South China Sea, irrespective of what the United States wants to do? So I think this question of U.S. commitment to the region and how it's measured against what the Chinese is, are doing is something that I think will be a persistent concern. It was a concern last year, and it's certainly was a concern this year as well. And I think the other thing to flag, um, which is kind of a, a very uncomfortable question is, um, you know, there were delegates that were questioning, you know, directly. I mean, Matt, it's great to hear from Secretary Mattis, but 
you know, what happens if Mattis himself actually leaves the Trump administration? I mean, it, it's another loss of a very strong personality who I think folks have looked to for reassurance. Um, but, you know, it's always uncomfortable where you have an administration where you have to rely on individual personalities rather than a strategic vision <laughs> to get that reassurance, right? Absolutely. Uh, I'm not going to say who, but I, I had at least two people confess to me at the dialogue that they went to bed every night praying for Mattis's health. <laughs> um, Non-Americans from uh, America allied uh, partnered countries, um, which I thought, you know, I think I think speaks to that point pretty well. And I think this year, you know, we have kind of seen uh, America first in action. Right. I mean, the tariffs uh, uh, have been implemented and announced. And, um, you know, Trump has shown that he's willing to do a lot of the things that he threatened to do last year. The uh, the the shadow of the U.S. China trade war is very real this year, so I think there are you know serious anxieties about about precisely that question when Mattis comes and says we're going to defend the post-war rules-based order, and then you have Trump kind of trampling all over that order back in Washington. Um, it's um, it's difficult for him to kind of credibly uh, make any commitments on behalf of this administration. Um, and you know to go back to the question of China and the South China Sea, uh, I should note that I found the uh, representative um, leading the Chinese delegation this year to be. Um, I guess entertaining. I mean, maybe that's not the right word, but uh, Lieutenant General uh, He Lei certainly had a style uh, that he brought to this year's um, discussions. Uh, you know, on one of the side s side sessions, he he said that you know he was the only person in the room who'd been to all seven of China's artificial islands in the Spratleys, and that uh, everybody should take his word, and no one should believe the rumors being reported by the American press uh, and probably the diplomat about the militarization of those status um, of the of those yeah. features. Uh, and I think a lot of people in the room kind of took it. Uh, I think he said, you know, come and see with your own eyes. And a lot of us took that as an invitation. You know, I'd be very happy to visit uh, Fiery Cross Reef or Mischief Reef uh, one of these days. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, certainly I think, you know, the Chinese were maybe, uh, you know, a little bit, uh, you know, self-satisfied. I mean, even even at the lower level that, you know, yes, I mean, the ship has sailed on the South China Sea um, in, in one view, and China can now come to the Shangri-La dialogue and comfortably, you know, address address many of these issues. I mean, I think also for China, you know, the, the reason China is no longer um, necessarily taking the Shangri-La dialogue so seriously is because I think, you know, the perception that this is really a forum for primarily, you know, the U.S. to come and roll out its annual um initiative, but also for, you know, the bilats on the sidelines, which obviously you and I weren't involved with, but, you know, that's a major component of the dialogue um, behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. um, but the perception in China is that, you know, this is really uh, not a China-friendly forum. Um, and it's difficult to disagree with that. I mean, just in reality, given many of these discussions. Uh, and China is now getting its own Shangshan forum off the ground. They will be conferring that uh, this year again. So it's uh, it, it seems likely that unless something changes um, going forward, that China will probably continue to send representation at the level of a fairly senior PLA general and then send a bunch of senior colonels around uh, to you know convey its messaging. But we don't really get anything new from a lot of these people apart from what you'll read in uh, you know Chinese state media. The uh, you know we we heard on the sidelines interviews where they were accusing the United States of militarizing the South China Sea. So, uh, you know, it, it, it does really seem like uh, China has sort of written off the Shangri-La dialogue at this point. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think the 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 response, um, interestingly, is 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 one of I think last year you saw a lot of press around this idea that the Chinese were downgrading their their presence. This year, I think, relatively speaking, there wasn't that much focus on the fact that they were doing it, which kind of speaks to that reality. Um, and I think the other angle of this is that um, unlike previous years, the Chinese didn't get, um, you know, they didn't send a high level enough uh, representation in terms of degree, but they also didn't get a major speaking slot this year. And so you, you had to kind of go into the concurrent sessions um, on, on the side to kind of figure out, um, you know, what the Chinese position uh, was on these issues where individual Chinese representatives were, or you'd have to rely on the questions that they were posing to the U.S. Um, delegation or others to figure out what where the Chinese were on this. But uh, at the same time, I, I think, you know, the, the Chinese official position is, is always pretty clear. So <laughs> I'm not sure how, how much we sort of gain from that, too. So. Yeah, I mean, you know, that said, I, I, you know, I certainly hope that, you know, this isn't a trend because I think it's good for the PLA to come engage with, um, you know, Western civil society and civil society from around the region and um, independent experts and even uh, other officials uh, at a mm -hmm. forum like this. It's, it's one of the few forums where they can do that. 
Um, so I, you know, I certainly hope that next year, um, we see a reversal, uh, but I'm not too optimistic. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, there was that moment in the Q and A with Mattis when, you know, the whole room gave him kind of impromptu applause. Um, and you know, I found that to be a little bit, you know, if I was a PLA senior colonel sitting in that room and everybody around me is applauding for a charming comment by the U S defense secretary, I mean, it's really going to feel like, you know, you're at the wrong cocktail party. Um, so I, I think for China, you know, that, that perception is very much going to stick. Um, but we'll see what they do with the Shangshan Forum. Um, I mm-hmm. think that is uh, turning into one of the uh, interesting forums where China gets to have everybody on their turf and make their messages very clear. Um, so I guess uh, we'll have uh, that to look forward to. Um, but Prashant, I think we'll uh, wrap it up there. Yep, yeah, sounds good. Great. Thanks for joining me. And uh, maybe I'll see you uh, next year at the dialogue or maybe uh, earlier than that, hopefully earlier. (laughs) Sounds good. Um, For listeners, thanks a lot for listening to the podcast. If you haven't subscribed to the show yet, please do so on either iTunes or Google Play. And if you have subscribed, but you haven't left us a review, please do so as well. It really helps get the word out about the show. Thanks a lot for listening. And we'll be back next week with more.